So I want to start with the hardest question first, which is there's so much information out there. I can go and I can see someone being a raw vegan and they look healthy. They say it's the best thing ever. I can go on myplate.gov um, and see that I'm recommended to have 25% of my meal be grains. So it's just like, there is so much information out there. And how do we know like who to trust? Like how do, how do we know what information to listen to? Excellent question. So it, it is very, very confusing. And I think some of the confusion is by design. And some of it is, is by ignorance. And I, I mean a specific thing by that word, not an insult to anybody. And some of it is just because what, what we're all doing is we're all bumping around in the dark, mm. trying to rediscover what a proper human diet actually is. Uh, there was a severe catastrophe about 13,000 years ago that... Uh, we didn't have any control over. And before that time, we were essentially what's known in the paleoanthropology literature as a super carnivore. We, uh, the majority of what we ate was a, an animal-based diet. We ate basically to say it in the common vernacular, we ate as much fatty meat as we could get our hands on. <clears throat> and if we couldn't get enough fatty meat, we would eat some plants. Uh, we, we most definitely ate plants back then. Uh, if we found some grains, we probably ate that too, because back then starvation was always a, a very real risk, right? And so you ate whatever was edible. But if you had your preference, if you if your your tribe was flourishing, you had lots of fatty meat. But if you were stuck in an ecological niche where you couldn't get fatty meat, then you ate whatever was available because you didn't want to starve to death and you didn't want your children to starve to death. So that was the first thing that really mucked up human nutrition was that huge catastrophe that I won't go into, but there's, there's ample data about this. And there's lots of YouTube videos if you want to know what happened 13,000 years ago. But then the second thing that really messed us up was when food changed from being a natural thing that you grew in your backyard or you raised in your pasture, it changed to being something that was shelf stable. And this happened with the advent of corporate growth in, uh, you know, at first in the UK, but then it, that kind of spread, that model spread all over the world where you could take something that once was food and you could process it and you could add all kinds of chemicals to it and put it in a, a can or put it in a bag or a box. And then you could ship it in a huge container ship across the ocean. And then you could drive it across the country in a big truck then you could store it in a warehouse for six months. And then you could put it on a store shelf and it would sit for another six to 18 months and still be edible and not acutely poisonous. And so that's a, that is an excellent profit model. If you can, and so in the United States, for example, corn, rice, wheat, oats, they're all subsidized by the federal government. And so basically the big food corporations get these commodities, because that's what they are. They're not food, in my opinion. And they can make products, which are not food, in my opinion, that are shelf stable, that won't, will not kill you acutely. So there's no danger of, a, you know, ongoing lawsuits because you kill my mama with this, you know, this, this pizza crust or with this, this loaf of bread. But they are, in fact, slow inflammatory poisons to the human system because the human system evolved to eat a, a super carnivore diet, which is about 70% meat. That's the optimal human diet, plus some uninflammatory plant foods. And there are, there are people who are very earnest and very sincere who think of vegan diet, that that is the proper human diet, even though there's been no cult, large culture on the planet of humans to ever eat a vegan diet. That's never happened in human history. But yet now we see daily messages on TV, magazine, social media saying, you know, vegan, vegan diet is the way, even though a vegan diet has never been proven safe for long-term human consumption in any control research ever. It's still put out there by preeminent health authorities and nutrition authorities like the Harvard School of Public Health. But there's no research showing that's a safe diet for long-term human consumption. The same goes for the American Diabetes Association diet and the American Heart Association diet and all these other diets that are out there 
because people hear about keto and low carb and carnivore and they're like, there's no long-term research showing that's safe. And that's true. But they, they never stop to think, to ask the question, is there long-term control research in humans that shows that a vegan diet is safe for long-term consumption or, or the ADA diet or the AHA diet or any of the, or the Weight Watchers diet? Has other long-term studies in humans showing that it is safe for long-term consumption? And the answer is no, there's none. Absolutely no control research showing that they are safe for human consumption. But a lot of people are impressed uh, by the, you know, the prestige. Oh, this guy, he's a, he's a nutritionist at Harvard. He, uh, obviously, he's not going to lie. He's going to tell us the truth. He would never say such a thing unless there was research to prove that. Well, sorry, guys, but yeah, they, they do that every single day. And it's because they believe that a plant-based diet is the proper human diet. It's not because they know it. It's because they believe it. So we literally, all of us are in the dark, fumbling around, bumping around, trying to rediscover what is a proper human diet, not just to keep us from starving to death. Because if you're starving, eat the grains, eat, the, eat all the junk, eat it all if you're starving. But if what you're trying to do is optimize your health, then you need to eat a proper human diet. And, and I think uh, many of us are well on the way to rediscovering what that is. And I think you are one of those people. Well, thank you. I, I am trying to optimize health as well. Um, and there, like you were saying too, there are other foods people can eat to have energy um, or to survive, but I would like to live my longest, healthiest, best quality life. Um, but in doing so, I've had a lot of people ask me, but doesn't red meat cause cancer? Yeah, and a lot of people believe that. But the, here, once again, we, we get in, and you have to understand a little bit about research, nutrition and medical research. So there's two basic types of research. There is research that can prove causation, right? And then there's research that shows a possible association. There has never been a study that proves that red meat increases the risk of cancer or heart, heart disease in humans. That, there has never been a single study that proves that. Some of you guys may have seen, uh, there are research studies that show that, uh, just for example, uh, if you eat lots of margarine in a New England state, that you're at increased risk of divorce. And, and there's, there's, there's associational research that shows that every time a new Nicolas Cage movie comes out, there's an increased risk of drowning in your home swimming pool. These are true studies that have been published. They show a possible association, but in no way do they make watching Nicolas Cage movies more dangerous. They don't, they, and they don't even attempt to say that. There, and so it, you're not at increased risk of divorce if you eat more margarine in a New England state. But these research studies showed a possible association. And that's the way all the research done showing a possible weak association between red meat and heart disease or cancer. That's how they were done. They were epidemiological studies and they wind up showing a, a relative risk uh, and that, that in no way proves causation. And so let me say again, very clearly, there has never been a research study conducted that proved that eating red meat increases your risk of any bad health outcome ever. And I suspect there never will be a study done like that because if, if they were to waste their money and do that study, they would show that the red meat's actually beneficial and lowers your risk of every chronic disease, including heart disease and cancer. Yeah, I'm not sure if that, that study is going to come out. Um, I haven't even, in schools, we're not taught this at all. In the world, we're not taught that at all. Um, and so the other question then is, if red meat doesn't cause heart attacks, what causes heart attacks? Yeah, exactly. And so uh, since the, the second catastrophe that I talked about earlier, in, in which large corporations make processed food and then sell that for a profit, that's when the heart disease epidemic started. When we started consuming lots of things like cottonseed oil, uh, canola oil, processed high sugar foods, processed grains, uh, that's when the true heart disease epidemic took off. So when we go back and look at uh, mummified remains of people who lived 
more than 12, 12 13,000 years ago, we find that they're, they have no cavities in their teeth, but they also their arteries are quite clean in the very few that we found that were preserved enough that we can see that. But when you start, and so even if you look at a, a population like the Egyptians, right, the ancient Egyptians who lived five, six, 7,000 years ago, everybody there got mummified to some degree, unless you were a prisoner or a prisoner of war, or you were just a, a, a homeless person, you got some degree of mummification because they believe that your soul could not pass to the promised land or whatever, unless these things were done to your dead body. And so we have tons of mummies from Egypt, from every social strata, not just the rich people. This, this includes middle class, upper middle class, everybody. And their mummies, when we put them in a CAT scanner or when we just, uh, do an autopsy on them, we find that their body is riddled with heart disease with blockages in the arteries, with plaque in the arteries. And you might, and so the, this was long before sugar was even discovered. Nobody could produce sugar back then. And they were not eating the modern GMO wheat. They were eating ancient emmer wheat, which a lot of, you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, it's these modern GMO wheats. Well, actually the Egyptians didn't have access to sugar and they also didn't have access to GMO wheat. They were eating the ancient wheat and had no sugar, added sugar in their diet whatsoever. But when you look at their arteries, they're riddled with atherosclerosis, with plaque buildup. And that's because they were eating a diet that was very high. It was plant-based diet. It was about 70% plants from ancient wheat, from lots of fruits, lots of vegetables. They ate a little bit of fish. They ate a little bit of poultry. They didn't eat any red meat because they needed their large ruminant animals to do work. And so they were too valuable to pull things like wagons and, and, you know, blocks to build pyramids. So they didn't eat them. So they were basically eating the diet that the Harvard School of Public Health tells us today, we need to eat lots of whole grains, lots of fruits, a little bit of fish and poultry, but no red meat at all. The Egyptians were eating that diet and they're, they're, they, had, they had dental abscesses, they had terrible cavities and they had terrible heart disease. So there has actually been an, uh, uh, an experiment done on the diet that all of the plant-based people are recommending and it didn't go well for the Egyptians. When you see one of their day-to-day -day statues, they all had man boobs and they all had little belly pooches because they were obviously hyperinsulinemic from eating all those carbohydrates every day. And, but when you go back further in time and you look you know, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 years ago, we find through stable isotope analysis that every, uh, every human back then ate 70% at least animal-based products. And so that's how I, I think that I know that we should eat an animal-based diet with, with a little veg if you want it is because that's what we did as a species, Homo sapiens sapien. We did that for 99% of our time on this planet. That's actually the meat rich diet is the diet that helped us to evolve into what we are today. And, and that makes a lot of sense to me, just looking back and seeing what people did in the past and our history on becoming a human. We did not have pizza and chips and cookies. Um, so then people will ask me, well, how long can you eat a carnivore diet? Or is it safe? Or, or who should be eating this way? Or how long should someone eat this way before it becomes not healthy? Yeah, so there is no time limit on a proper human diet. If you are a human being, then you need to mimic the diet that our ancestors ate on this planet for 99% of their time in, cap in, in, in the wild or in captivity, either way you want to put it. Uh, so there is no human on the planet that will not benefit from eating a proper human diet that's full of fatty meat plus or minus some veg. I don't care if you had your gallbladder removed, your thyroid removed, your uh, appendix, your spleen. It doesn't no. matter what medical condition you have. You need to eat a proper human diet that's full of fatty meat. And, and uh, so it would be like saying, well, okay, you know, deer, they eat grass and, and, and clover and stuff. How long is it safe for them to eat grass and clover? You see, it kind of becomes a foolish question. You're like, well, dummy, that's exactly, that's what they're supposed to eat. So they should eat that their entire life for optimal deer health. Same goes for human beings. We should eat that, that fatty meat heavy diet for our entire lives. Starting with our first solid meal, when we're weaned from breast milk, it should be, it should mimic from day one, that fatty meat heavy diet that we ate 
for our entirety of existence on this planet and indeed should continue into old age because this is not a fad. This is not some new thing that some dummy thought up. This is what humans have done for 99% of our time on this planet. Therefore, that's what we should mimic as best we can. Right. And that's where I feel like the standard American diet has become so normalized that for someone to say, I eat keto or I, I eat a lot of meat, um, then it just seems like there's a lot of questions that come up. Um, one of the most asked questions I'm actually asked is how do you go to the bathroom without fiber? Like if you're eating a strict carnivore diet without any fiber, like how, how does that all work? Yeah, and this is a very interesting question. There's, there's actually some research which my buddy, Dr. Paul Mason, talks about that people have fewer bowel complaints and less constipation if they eat a fiber-free diet. But this is not, see, and here's the problem. This is not ever going to get studied at the big universities because they firmly believe in their heart of hearts that you must have fiber or you're just going to die. So they would never, you know, the chairman of the Department of Nutrition at Harvard would never sanction a study and would definitely never fund a study with with money to look at a fiber-free diet so that's never going to be studied so all we have to go on is the one study dr paul mason talks about in his youtube videos and then the the anecdotal evidence that we have from tens of thousands of carnivores who are currently eating a carnivore diet and anybody who starts a, a kind of a radical sounding diet like that there's Facebook groups for that. There's, there's Reddit uh, subgroups. There's all these places where people get, get together and they talk about their experiences on a carnivore diet. And what they say, almost without exception, is that my, my, my bowel habits get much better, much less intrusive into my life. There's less smell. There's less volume. I have my constipation I used to suffer from all the time goes completely away when I'm eating a zero fiber diet. So what you would think you would see if fiber is really so essential and really you have to eat it every day or bad things are going to happen to you. You should see in the carnivore groups and, and on Reddit, you should see these carnivores games saying, dude, I, I really love this carnivore diet. I love eating bacon and ribeye, but I, I've been constipated for a month or I developed colon cancer or I just, I can't, my, my, I'm so bloated and gassy. I can't continue this carnivore diet. You would see that kind of comment regularly. In, in the carnivore groups, right? You'd have to because fiber is so essential that you would have a 90% dropout rate. People would do carnivore for a few months and say, I just can't do this anymore. My gut's so locked up. I'm, I'm in such pain. I've got to go back to eating fiber. But you never see those comments. You, you just don't ever see that comment in any of the carnivore places where carnivores get together. What you see is the exact opposite. And so if fiber is such a necessity, then either of these carnivore groups are really censoring the people who have terrible gut symptoms because they're eating zero fiber. But I don't, I don't really believe that's what ha what's happening. I believe we're all honestly trying to rediscover, is it, is it okay to eat zero fiber? Is it safe? Is it, is it a doable thing? Is it sustainable? Mm -hmm. And tens of thousands of carnivores say, yeah, dude, I have zero gut problems or bowel problems with a carnivore diet. And that to me speaks more than like some sort of research article or some sort of study, like a real person with their actual experience means so much to me. Um, and I haven't experienced that myself, <laughs> but uh, the number one question I'm asked is what about high cholesterol? Like how does this whole carnivore diet work? And if someone has high cholesterol, like what, what does that mean? So about one third of people who eat a ketogenic or a carnivore diet will notice that their, their total cholesterol goes down. About one third of people will notice that their cholesterol doesn't change at all, eating keto or carnivore versus the standard American crap. And about a third of people will notice that their total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol go up when they're eating what I consider to be a proper human diet. Uh, so first of all, the heart, uh, the fat heart hypothesis was just that a hypothesis that having high cholesterol uh, and eating lots of saturated fat would cause heart disease in humans. That is a hypothesis, which means a smart guy just came up with an idea and then he, he started researching that. The problem is, is that the, the really controlled research has never shown 
a absolute causation between eating a high cholesterol diet or a high fat diet and heart disease. In fact, the American Heart Association has stopped recommending a maximum intake of cholesterol in the diet. They don't even talk about that anymore. Uh, they've also pulled back and, and stopped saying that eating saturated fat will increase your risk of heart disease. The American Heart Association pulled that from their guidelines. But since they didn't have a press release on CNN and Fox News, the average person out there still thinks that eating diets rich in cholesterol and uh, fat will increase your risk of heart disease. But that's the research has never shown that, never supported that. That hypothesis failed. But there are still many um, ignorant doctors and other healthcare providers out there who think that eating a high cholesterol diet will give you heart disease or think that eating a, a, fat, a diet high in saturated fat will give you heart disease. But that's never been proven, never been shown. All the studies are very embarrassingly they fail, and this has been happening since the 1960s. And some of this research has actually been hidden and, and not published in, a, in the large journal it should have been published in when they found that, oh, if you, if you replace the saturated fat found in butter and red meat if you, and eggs, if you replace that with a vegetable oil like corn oil, people actually get cancer more often and they actually have more heart disease. There were three studies like that that were done, huge control studies in humans that showed that, yeah, when you replace animal fat with vegetable fat, people get sicker quicker. Uh, and they just either weren't published at all, or they were published in some obscure little journal that no, they, in a foreign language that nobody read. So nobody in the United States, or indeed modern society, they've never heard that. And so they still believe the disproven myth that eating cholesterol and saturated fat will cause heart disease. And so now we have to shine the light of truth on this whole, oh, your total cholesterol is high. You're at increased risk of heart attack. Well, actually, when you look at the control research, it turns out that's, that's not true at all. When you look at the LDL cholesterol <clears throat> research that's done well and controlled, you either find a tiny, tiny increased risk or you don't find any risk at all. But when you look at research and you say, hey, what about having elevated blood sugar? What about having elevated insulin from eating too many carbohydrates? What if you have chronic inappropriate inflammation from eating inflammatory foods? There's a huge uh, association between those things and having heart disease, heart attack, stroke. Uh, and, and even in control research, the people who are eating diets that cause their blood sugar and their insulin and their levels of inflammation to elevate those are the people who are at risk of having a heart attack and smokers, of course, that, that research is pretty clear as well. It's not people who are eating saturated fat and, and cholesterol. That's not who's having the heart attacks. So then as a doctor, if I get my blood test results, what number are you looking for then that signifies health or that I should be changing something like what number matters to you? I would assume like, I mean, does it matter then if I'm 25 years old and I'm not eating sugar and I'm not eating grains and I have high cholesterol versus somebody who's maybe 70 years old and they, they're on statins and they're eating sugar and they're eating grains and they have high cholesterol? Like at that point, does high cholesterol matter to you? No, I don't think it matters at all. And so wow. the, the, the majority of the damage that leads up to a heart attack is done over decades. So I care just as much about a 20 year old's diet as I care about an 80 year old's diet because that 20 year old, even though they may have squeaky clean arteries right now, they will develop uh, blockages and plaques and buildups and inflammation in their arteries if they eat an improper human diet, okay? So when I have somebody of any age uh, that I check lab work on, I'm gonna check a lipid panel, definitely, but I'm gonna be looking, I'm gonna be focusing on are their triglycerides normal? Is their HDL cholesterol normal? Because if your triglycerides are high, that tells me right off the bat, you're eating too many carbohydrates for your personal biochemistry. You got to cut the carbs. The triglycerides are intimately linked with heart attack and stroke if they're high. Low HDL cholesterol is also very strongly linked with heart attack and stroke. If your HDL is low, you got to cut the carbs and eat more fatty meat and lift heavy things. That's how you're going to get your HDL up. I always check a hemoglobin A1C on everybody I order lab work on because if that's even a one tenth of a point elevated, I know you're eating too many carbohydrates for your personal biochemistry 
that's going to lead to heart disease and stroke. If your C peptide or your fasting insulin are elevated, then I know you're eating too many carbohydrates for your personal biochemistry. That is going to increase your risk of heart attack and stroke, right? I'm going to look for markers of chronic inappropriate inflammation in your body. And there's a list of these. And if those are chronically elevated, you're at increased risk of heart attack and stroke. I'm gonna check a coronary artery calcium score to see how much plaque you already have built up so that we'll kind of know where you're starting from. But it, but I, I, I couldn't give uh, any, the, I don't give the tiniest little damn about what your total cholesterol is because the research has thoroughly disproven total cholesterol as a marker for heart attack and stroke risk. It's, if your doctor says, oh, your total cholesterol is high, I got to put you on a statin, your doctor's at least 15 years behind on reading the literature. They, had, they literally don't have a clue as to what causes heart attack and stroke. If your doctor says, oh, your LDL is high, I need to put you on a statin. That's a little less bad than starting a statin for a high total cholesterol, but it's not much better because the, the LDL... Uh, elevation model of heart disease is quickly being disproven. Your doctor needs to be looking for elevated A1C, elevated C peptide, elevated markers of inflammation, elevated triglycerides or low HDL. Those are the true markers that have the highest correlation with risk when it comes to heart attack and stroke. Wow, that was that was very helpful because even I'm like, what are we looking for? Like what number really matters? Um, okay, so then let's say you have a patient come in and they have their blood work done and it looks like they have high triglycerides. What, what does that mean to you then? Like, what are you going to say? Is it diet? Like you always are going to be fixing the diet first or is it other lifestyle things like sleep and stress or um, just like other lifestyle things? Or is it, so is it always the diet that you're, you're going to be concerned about and working on first or is it other uh, lifestyle changes that need to happen? Yep. So, and that's an excellent question because people get very confused about this because there's gurus out there telling you that, you know, cold therapy is the answer. People telling you that getting uh, good sleep is the answer. People telling you that somehow you just got to stop worrying about the stressful things in your life. That is the answer. And I disagree with all those people on the degree to which they, they emphasize that that is the answer. Okay. I think that, that your diet that you eat on a daily basis, that is 90% of your health, okay? So if, if your diet is not proper, then you can, you can jump into the icy water with William Hoff. You can get the best sleep of your life with Ben Greenfield. You can absolutely just you know go to the Himalayan mountains and meditate and get rid of all your stress. But if you're eating a junk, crap, high carbohydrate diet filled with sugars and grains and vegetable oils, you're, you're playing around with the, the little 1% solutions. Because I do think everything you mentioned is important. I think it matters. Absolutely. But 90% of the battle is going to be fought with your fork and your spoon and your knife and your plate and your, your glass. That's where 90% of your health is going to come from. And then absolutely mind your sleep. Absolutely mind your stress levels. Absolutely go out and get some sun and maybe even jump into a, an icy lake. That, that, there may, that may be 1% of reversing the, the epidemics of chronic diseases that we have in modern society. But the, the diet you got, that's got to be 90% of your focus. Because what happens is people get, they get distracted off and so it's like oh well this person said if I, I need to take this handful of supplements and this person said then i need to uh get you know sun on my perineum i need to you know sun my nether regions and this person said i need to sleep 10 hours a day and they wind up spending their time and their energy and their money on those things while they're not spending money on good quality human food and that's that you're wasting your not only your money, but you're wasting your time and you're wasting your effort and your stamina, which you only get so much of each day. And so I think it, it has to be really clear to people. Ninety percent of all this is is your diet. Focus all your attention there. Focus all your money there. Focus all your your perseverance and your stamina. All that stuff has got to be focused on the most important thing. Right. 
And it'd be like if somebody, if, if the house was on fire and somebody had a, a five gallon bucket and then somebody else had a teaspoon and this guy was just running to the, to the, the faucet, getting a teaspoon of water. And he was just working his butt off, right? With this teaspoon that he was throwing on the fire, the guy with the five gallon bucket is going to be much more effective at putting out the fire than the guy with the teaspoon because he's focusing on what matters, which is getting the, the maximum amount of water as possible on that fire. The guy with the teaspoon is working hard. He went and bought a, a silver spoon because he, he heard that would help be, you know carry water better, but he's wasting his time and effort and all of his energy with the teaspoon. He needs to get the five gallon bucket or preferably a fire truck and put the fire out. And I think diet is the fire truck. That's the 90% solution is you got to eat a proper human diet. Spending money is a big deal, but spending your, your willpower, spending your effort, spending your time, those things are valuable too. People just think, oh, money is the only value. But if you've exhausted yourself at the gym and you've spent all your money on this big shelf of supplements and you've exhausted all your willpower trying to hold your legs up so you can sun your perineum for 10 minutes a day and working out at the gym and you've tried, you know, you're just spending all your effort. Then when you get, when it's time to eat, you're already exhausted and broke. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to reach for the cheapest, snackiest stuff you can find. And that's going to undo any benefit that you got from all those other ancillary things right if if i was working out at the gym for three hours on end but still going home and then it gonna eat whatever then it, it just doesn't doesn't add up <laughs> um but are there any ancillary things i mean i guess specifically supplements are there any supplements that you think then people should especially if they're eating a carnivore or a keto or low carb diet are there any supplements that you think that people should be having but uh, I recommend plenty of salt on a carnivore diet, and I recommend that you go out of your way to get minerals and uh, potassium and magnesium on a carnivore diet. And here's why I think it's ancestrally appropriate for us to kind of think about salt and think about um, minerals and electrolytes on a carnivore diet. M meat definitely has all those things, but it may not have it in the, the amount that we need as human beings. And so what you have to think is, let's go back in time 100,000 years. What did people drink? Did they drink water? That They drank water 100%, no doubt about that. But did they drink city water? Did they drink water that was devoid of minerals and electrolytes? No, they drank surface groundwater. They drank water out of a stream, out of a river, out of a lake, out of, out of a mud puddle. All of these sources are rich in minerals and rich in the, the electrolytes. So I think that they didn't have to worry about supplementing with electrolytes on a carnivore diet because they were, they were naturally supplementing by drinking groundwater. That's the water they had to drink, so that's what they drank. And all of those sources are rich in these electrolytes and minerals. So I think a lot of people try to do just beef and water. And, and so I think a lot of those people are going to have trouble because they're not getting enough salt in their diet, because they're not getting enough electrolytes and minerals in their diet, because the water that they are drinking has been artificially treated to remove, first of all, remove dangerous things, of course, that's why it's treated, but it also removes all the most of the minerals and electrolytes. And, and so then therefore you're, you're winding up electrolyte depleted salt depleted because you're not adding salt to your diet and making sure that you mine your minerals and get plenty of electrolytes. A lot of diets like, you know, the vegan diet, not to pick on vegans, because I think vegans are at least trying to be healthy. They're, you know, right. So I totally honor that in them, but they have to supplement with, there's a long list and even big vegan influencers like Dr. Gregor, if you go to watch his YouTube video about supplements, he'll tell you, you need vitamin B12, you need iodine, you need vitamin D, you need vitamin K2. I mean, there's a long list of supplements that they have to take, things which are found in real human food, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you add fatty meat to your diet, you can forget about having to supplement with all those supplements. But then you have to go back to the more basic things like minerals. So we are mammals. We have to have salt and we have to have minerals, which are electrolytes also. And so we would probably have found a rock or found some mud, or drank surface water. That's how we got that 100,000 years ago and why we didn't need supplements. Now our water is so pure of some things, and then they add other things that I'm not so happy about. 
but they don't have the minerals and they don't have the electrolytes like they used to. Okay, so when I was a kid though, I wasn't really thinking about this. I wasn't thinking about salt and electrolytes. And uh, so as a young, as a kid, you can get away with eating pretty much anything sometimes it seems like, and you don't see any repercussions to health. How come it is that you know young people can look skinny or look healthy and, and get away with eating like chips and, and soda and, and then and then that's not, is, is it the same, is it impacting their health the same way that it's impacting somebody who's older? Yeah, I think when you're in your teenage years and your early 20s, you can live on Pepsi and jelly donuts. And I think when you're younger like that, you're much more resilient. You're much more able to, to utilize the, the, the relatively unnutritious crap that the average teenager eats. You're, you're able to use that and turn it into energy. But you got to remember when you eat food, you're doing multiple things. You're giving your body energy for right then, but you're also, your cells are constantly turning over. You're constantly making new skin cells, new arterial cells, new brain cells even. You're making new cells for every organ of your body every day. And if the building material that you're giving those organs to build with are inferior, then you're going you're gonna to be building inferior organs and inferior arteries. And that's not going to show itself in, you know, in a, a, a week or a month. And for most people, it starts happening somewhere between 25 and 35. They start to notice that, hey, I'm not getting the same benefits from my diet as I used to get. I'm going to have to change something or I'm going to wind up being a fat diabetic with a fatty liver. And that's, that's when if the, you have to pay the piper, so to speak, is, is somewhere between 25 and 35. That's when you start to get sick, get fat, get inflamed and, and have problems. And I think it's because enough years of junk diets have built enough uh, inferior tissues and organs that it starts to manifest itself clinically or where you can actually tell, oh my God, I've got a belly. What, where'd that come from? Because, you know, when I was in my teens, I ate junk all the time and I was skinny as a rail. I had a, a 40 inch vertical jump everything worked like it, you know, and I thought, well, boom, it doesn't matter what you eat. But then when I got about 30, 35, it became very obvious that what I eat matters very much. And I wish I could go back in time and slap my teenage self and say, hey, stop the donuts, dude. Okay. Because you're, you're harming me in the future. I need you to eat a proper human diet, even at that early age. I think when you're younger, it doesn't, either it doesn't matter as much or it doesn't seem to matter outwardly as much. There are many people who, if they, if they don't eat a proper human diet, even in their teens and 20s, they'll start to develop things like irritable bowel. They'll start to develop mental health disorders. They'll start to develop psoriasis, eczema, acne. All these things get markedly worse when you're eating a, a high carbohydrate diet full of grains and other junk but many people seemingly have no symptoms whatsoever. So I think that when you're young and healthy, you need to be thinking about what is a proper human diet? What should I eat every single day of my life? And you need to call junk what it is junk. And that includes things that, that have got, you know, the stamp of approval like cornflakes and raisin bran, that stuff's 100% junk as well. But the corporations will market it as healthy, part healthy, oh, it's healthy. Uh, but it's not, it's still just junk. But I think there's a majority of people when they're in their teens and twenties, they don't really have any outward signs when they're eating junk food, but they, if you were to go ahead and do a, a CAC score on them or a uh, carotid ultrasound, you would see that they're already starting to form plaque in their arteries. And indeed we there, there's research that shows this conclusively, even in, in, you know, young men who died in battle in their 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, they've already got substantial plaque buildup in their arteries when they do the CAT scan of the autopsy. And it's because of the junk diet that they were eating. And so having a 10% blockage in your artery, we can see that on a CAT scan or, or in an autopsy, but that's not going to make you have a heart attack. Right. And that's why it seems like these kids in their twenties and teens can eat this stuff. And there's no, there's no ramifications, right? There's nothing bad happens. But they, so if you, if you get into your fifties and you've built up an 80% blockage in one of your heart arteries, you're in trouble. That's bad. And so that's why it's so important to start eating a proper human diet as early in life as you can. So that when you get to 50, you've just got a 10 or 20% buildup. That's not, still not a big deal at all. 
right? But if you get to 50 and your years of eating crap, now you've got an 80, 90% blockage, you're in a world of trouble. And, and it, the reversal of that is possible with a proper human diet, but it's a very, very slow reversal. Whereas you could have just prevented it 30, 40, 50 years ago and not have to worry about it now that you're 50. I know teenagers, first of all, they don't ever want to be 50 because 50 is old, right? And they also can't imagine ever being 50. It's like, I can't, I, my brain doesn't even, I can't see myself as an old person because that's what 50 is when you're a teenager, I remember. But now that I am 50, 52 to be exact, I still want to be vigorous and vibrant and potent and I want to I want to be out working on the farm I don't want to be sitting in a chair and every time I get up and go to the bathroom I'm short of breath because I got a 90% blockage I don't want that and I don't want that for any of the young people who think it doesn't matter what I eat right now I can eat whatever and and I'm so young it's fine it, it's you're, you're getting damaged you just can't detect it 100% I um I don't eat you know donuts and people will say well you're missing out you're missing out on life and I'm like no, I'm going to have more life. Um, but I, I guess let, for last question, what do you typically eat in a week? And other than food and diet, what other lifestyle practices and things do you do each day to remain strong and healthy? Yeah, so I spend 90% of my time, effort, and money on the best quality human food that I can procure, okay? And for me, that seems to be lots of fatty ruminant meat, a uh, little bit of chicken, a little bit of fish, a little bit of seafood, but the, I feel best and perform best when the majority of my diet is ruminant animal meat, which would be cow, sheep, goat, uh, venison, bison, moose, anything that has a ruminant stomach. I seem to just do better when I eat fatty cuts of their meat. And then occasionally I will cheat on carnivore uh, with keto and I'll have an avocado once a month or I'll have some olives or some pickles once every month or two or I'll, you know, I, and so I don't, I don't think you have to be a hundred percent carnivore unless you have one of those dastardly medical problems like a mental health issue or a bowel issue or a skin issue, then you may need to eat hundred percent carnivore to keep those things at bay. Uh, but you know, a lot of people don't have to eat 100% carnivore, but I think optimal health is going to be found on the diet we evolved on, which is 70% fatty meat, and then add the, the, the veg or plants of your choice that don't seem to cause inflammation within your personal biochemistry and physiology. Uh, I drink water. I do drink some, some coffee. I've got my hollow roast uh, cup here. I love coffee. Do I think coffee is good and optimal for me? No, I do not. But I, my body tolerates it. I don't seem to have any immediate feedback. So I make an exception for coffee. Coffee's not carnivore. We've only been drinking coffee as a species for a few hundred years. It's a very new behavior for human beings to drink coffee. So in no way do I think it's ancestrally appropriate. I don't think it's part of a proper human diet, but I freaking love it. I'm gonna drink it. And if I suffer from that later in life, then that'll be my own damn fault. But I'm very clear about that. I think the same goes for dairy. I love butter and ghee. I love heavy cream. I love real full fat fermented cheese. But we've only been eating those things for about four or 5,000 years, right? So in no way can I imply that they're part of a proper human diet. I think the fat from, from dairy is totally fine because it mimics so closely the fat that you find in the flesh of animals. I think it's fine to eat, but the protein, especially certain proteins, and certain amino acids in dairy are a problem for many, many people. And they never diagnose that problem until they do a month or two of a dairy free. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, I thought I felt great before. Now without dairy, I feel freaking amazing. And this got better and that got better. Uh, I think the, the lactose in, in milk is great for babies because it helps them grow and put on fat and tissue very quickly. But if your goal is to not put on fat and tissue very quickly, then you should avoid lactose and the two sugars it's made up of. I think it's, uh, they are ancestrally appropriate for, for growing baby mammals, but in no way is dairy appropriate for an adult mammal, including humans. But I love butter, and I think that butter is, is the, by far the least bad of the macronutrients found in dairy. So I eat it because I love it.
Okay, but I can't I can't pretend that it's part of the human diet because we've only been doing it for a few thousand years. Wow, I was not expecting that answer, especially not about what you said about coffee. Um, but thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to do this and to put more information out there. If people want more information and they want to follow along with your journey, where can people find you? Well, first of all, let me say that I'm 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 honored and grateful and very happy that you invited me to do this. I love your YouTube channel. I, Misha and I watch it all the time. Uh, I've got also have a little YouTube channel. If people just search for Dr. Barry, I think they'll find Aww. it on YouTube. Yeah, just a little thing. And I've got a Facebook page. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on TikTok. Yeah, I'm a TikToker. I'm, I'm in, so you can find me on all social media pretty much. But uh, the majority of where I'm really trying to help teach people is going to be on uh, YouTube and Facebook. Then I'm also I have a Patreon page where you can help us and join that journey if you'd like.